thank you very, very much, <clears throat> Mansi, and thank you for the invitation uh, to this very interesting meeting. Interesting to me because I began my scientific career many, many years ago working on aflatoxin in the laboratory, about a year after it was first reported in the literature. Uh, so I was a very early uh, uh, investigator. Uh, I have no recollection of what I really did, but uh, I know it was fun. And I've stayed interested ever since. One other mycotoxin uh, thing that I recall this morning is my, I, I actually wrote a review paper during that time uh, on my favorite nine-syllable word, stachybotryotoxicosis. Any, anybody familiar with stachybotrys toxin? Yeah, so I remember that. I have no idea why I wrote that either. But I left that all behind me in the early 70s and moved into the broader world of risk analysis. And that's what I'm going to talk to you mostly about. What Paul just so wonderfully described, that decision model that he described, evolves from current, much current thinking in the world of risk analysis. So my emphasis is going to be on risk analysis uh, and um, how then we try to use it to make good decisions, in this case about mitigation of mycotoxins. I am no longer even remotely a mycotoxin expert. You will see that as I go along. And this is a mysterious, okay, I guess it's not so mysterious. This is an approximate outline of my talk. I'm going to talk a bit about the risk assessment process itself and what goes on in it. It is not perfect. Uh, a lot of things we think of as sort of settled science are very far from settled. Uh, and so I want to go into that in a little bit of detail. Uh, it's also uh, not always, uh, the way we now do it is not always useful for decisions, and I want to talk about that a bit as well. And then I'll move toward uh, uh, sort of talking about some of the same themes that Paul just talked about. Uh, uncertainty, you see, is in there. I'm, I'm drawing my talk, and most of what I've uh, what, what most people in the world of risk analysis are working on came from studies mostly done by, our, in the U.S. at least, by the National Academy of Sciences. The first one, that book on the left, the red book from 1983, set out the basic framework for risk assessment, distinguishes assessment from management. And I must say that we still, in many cases, do not distinguish those very well. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But that's the basic framework for the risk assessment process, 1983. This book in 1983 is a very important addition to that whole field. It is a very good scientific volume about risk assessment, and it's also about improving the utility of risk assessment for decisions. Because that's what there are people embark on risk assessment without thinking much about the use of the assessment process. And this book on the right attempts to change that. And we're beginning to see, uh, especially at the EPA now, especially at the EPA, moves in the directions ad, uh, advocated by that book on the right. And I'm going to go into that near the end of my talk. Uh, uncertainty is not an afterthought. Uncertainty is very important. There's a IOM study on that that I will also mention very briefly. <clears throat> right. First of all, let's talk about two different, uh, this is a simplified version, but it's not too simplified, decision contexts in which we uh, express risk results. On the left, I just call it approach A, lack of a better term. We estimate what we think to be the maximum conditions of population exposure, the dose at which the toxic effects of a chemical are not likely to occur. We call that a safe dose, safe as in quotes, because it doesn't mean absolute safety. I will come back to that. Approach B is where uh, the kind of models actually that I think are important and that, that we're moving toward are where we're estimating the probabilities of toxic effects, that's risk, under different conditions of exposure, how risk changes with exposure. And that's a much more useful kind of model. Uh, we're not there yet on many toxic endpoints, but we should be moving in that direction. So the, the approach A you're all familiar with, perhaps, because you're, you're familiar with terms like ADIs and TDIs. T TDIs are used for contaminants of food rather than the things we intentionally introduce into food. It's the same idea. We treat them as, what well, I'll just use the term bright lines. We, think it, we treat them as bright lines between safe and unsafe doses. Uh, that's how they are treated. They are not, but that's how they are treated uh, for decision purposes. <clears throat> 
the threshold assumption lies behind their derivation that you need to exceed some threshold uh, before you reach a toxic dose. That's an assumption in all these cases. And they're routinely used for all forms of toxicity, hundreds of different forms of toxicity, except for cancer, at least in the US. And I will come back to cancer later. So this is a typical dose-response relationship. That's the starting point for deriving the ADI or TDI. Uh, most toxic dose-response curves look something like this. The, uh, the, you, most of them come from animal studies, but there's also substantial data from some human studies. It's harder to get good quantitative information on dose and response from human studies, but where we have it, as in the case of aflatoxin, for example, we use it. Uh, and we focus on the low end of those dose response curves, something called the no effect level, something that approximates what we think is a threshold dose for toxicity in the population that is studied, animal population or human population. And that's the starting point for doing the assessment. I'll just call that, some people call that a point of departure POD for doing the assessment process. But a lot of work gets to, gets, gets to the, is needed to get you to this point before you're ready then to begin looking at what's going to happen at exposures outside this range. Because most human exposures will be well below anything we can measure in studies. So we've got to go outside the range, that's extrapolation. What we do, and what we've been doing for quite a long time, is to begin with that no effect dose. Uh, some people call it a benchmark dose. I'll just call it the point of departure here. And we apply to it what are called uncertainty factors. Some people call these safety factors. They're not safety factors. The world of risk analysis would say that's a misuse of the term. If you want, that's a philosophical discussion that I'll hold off on. But they're uncertainty factors. They deal with uncertainty in the data, uncertainty in the variability, which we know exists in the human population, uncertainty about animal to human extrapolation. And we do not now generally have good quantitative information on those uncertainties. So we use these sort of default values of unknown scientific merit. To do, and and they, we then take the po point of departure and divide by uncertainty factors to end up with something called an ADI. So once we get to the ADI or the TDI, uh, that's still not uh, the bright line we work with. We temp generally take that as a, uh, I, I, sh I skipped a step. The, once we get to that ADI or TDI, that, that ADI or TDI is called, is a dose, it's not a risk measure, and we call it a dose that we think to be safe, meaning the risks associated with it are small. <laughs> Unquantified, but small. Now, can we prove that? We don't, we can't prove that. We think they're probably small, but we don't have them quantified. And that is a limit on the value of the ADI or TDI for decision making. So I will come back to that. But once you've got that as a bright line separating safe and unsafe exposure, you convert that to something called a standard for foods, which takes into account, that's, that's the, the ADI or TDI tells you the total amount of daily intake that you think is safe. You then need to know something about food consumption to convert that to a what's called a tolerance or a maximum residue level. And so a lot of, so those, that, those then become the actual bright lines that we use to decide on whether a particular lot of food, for example, is safe or unsafe. I might say that uh, if it's truly to be risk-based, the derivation of the MRL or the tolerance should be based entirely on the ADI or TDI and food consumption rate. No other factors, risk factor, no other factors should influence the derivation of a tolerance or MRL. In some cases, that is done. In other cases, other factors come in, for sure, having to do with practicability. But I think in many cases, these tolerances you see or other measures of other kinds of standards are a little fuzzy on the difference between the risk component to those, uh, uh, those numbers and other influences on them. We might come back and talk about that. But that is an area where assessment and management become a little confused. I think Paul made this same point. Um, there are limitations for the bright line models. They're perfectly good for decisions about uh, 
forget about the scientific limits I just mentioned, but given that we have, and that's our current model, they're, they're quite good for things that we intentionally introduce into food. Um, th th and I'll show you why in a second. They're not risk-free. I've mentioned that point. So we don't know the risk at the TDI. We don't know the risk above it or below it. We can't claim it's zero, but we don't know where we are. And there are people now working on it. I'll mention some of this, ways to get better measures, quantitative measures of risk for decision making, uh, both for setting standards like this and then also for other kinds of purposes. So they're not very useful for decisions. Look at the bottom point here. There are many important decisions where we involve some kind of trade-off about either we're comparing one risk with another or we're looking at risk versus, for example, technological achievability, that kind of question. And bright line uh, numbers are not very useful for that kind of analysis. And I'll show you what is a better approach. I, I mentioned, uh, cat I categorize food substances in three ways because it helps decide what kind of risk analysis model is useful for looking at them. And you've heard this term a couple of times already. On the left, I talk about the substances in food which are necessary and unavoidable. Those are the nutrients and the natural components. Th that, in fact, those present much greater problems than we're dealing with here today. Uh, in terms of the challenges for risk analysis. But I'm not going to talk about those at all. But the other two, the B and C, I re label as not readily avoidable, and C on the right, intentionally introduced and readily avoidable. By readily avoidable, I mean if we decide it's safe, we can have it. If we decide it's unsafe, it doesn't meet our bright line criterion, we just take it out. Now, manufacturers may not always like that, but it's clearly a readily avoidable kind of substance. That's quite different from the mycotoxin problem or the process uh, chemical kinds of problem or the naturally occurring, the uh, industrial chemical contaminants. Those are much more complicated problems. And my point is that the bright line model doesn't deal with them very well. So the, uh, keep those terms in mind. The category C are the intentionally introduced, B, read, not readily avoidable kinds of categories. So for the C category, the bright line model is fine. I just I, I won't repeat all of this, but we can uh, use that risk model and decide whether something is safe or unsafe using it, as long as it's purely risk-based uh, uh, decision. On the right, we've got uh, exposures that are not readily available, avoidable. We might establish tolerances based on a TDI. We can calculate TDIs, and we do this all the time, and they're necessary, but they don't solve the problem. They are necessary to do a check on what we're doing, but they, are, they have limited ability to solve the problems. Even in countries with advanced regulatory systems, and in countries with, that don't have advanced regulatory systems, simply having a standard and some kind of enforcement program doesn't solve the problem. There are other uses of risk assessment that can help us understand better ways to solve the problem. So I, don't, I, I certainly think they're important, but they're not enough and risk assessment can do more to help. Uh, I will say that there is one form of toxicity for which we've got good quantitative models now, and that's cancer. Uh, uh, these, are, this, this, these models have been around since the 70s. People are all hesitant to use them many times because they talk about risk explicitly. And a lot of people don't like to talk about risk explicitly, but uh, we should. Uh, that's what I would argue. So there are good models for uh, carcinogens that generally look something like this. Uh, there's that point of departure. We're now into the region of extrapolation well below anything we can measure. The, this is a linear dose response model where lifetime risk is on the left, on the uh, vertical axis versus dose. The linear model is, uh, has justification for many carcinogens. Notice there's no risk-free exposure. No risk-free exposure. It doesn't mean there aren't safe levels, but there's no risk-free exposure. But safety would be defined here in terms of some very small level of defined risk. That, that, is, a very, uh, that is a very clear uh, way uh, to describe uh, safety. So this kind of model exists. We don't use it enough, but we could use it much more for aflatoxin and other. Uh, we don't use it enough in regulatory decisions, uh, but we should. So 
uh, for where you have carcinogens that are in, in intentionally introduced, either one, the law says you can't introduce them, the so-called Delaney Clause at all, or if you can, there are tools you can use where you set a bright line standard based on some very low level of risk. 10 to the minus sixth risk for a carcinogen is often used for things that are intentionally introduced. Uh, it's in, in the pesticide world, it's in the world of indirect food additives, and many other areas of regulation. So it's a bright line standard, but with a defined level of risk. For other substances not so e easily avoidable, that kind of cancer model, you look at how, it, how risk changes with exposure. And that helps you make some decisions, as I'll try to uh, show a, a little bit uh, later. Now, uh, EPA in particular recognized a number of years ago that the Bright Line model is not, they've got a lot of problems with uh, difficult substances which are difficult to avoid. Air contaminants, food, uh, water contaminants, soil contaminants. They need to make decisions and the Bright Line models for them are of limited value. So they introduced this notion of margin of exposure, which looks at how, how the margin between the toxic dose and the exposure changes as you reduce exposure. So you get what, what is called an MOE. That's a better, more useful tool, but it is also a, not a quantitative measure of risk. It is just a safety margin. And bigger, it means safer, but it doesn't tell you how much safer. So it's a good way to proceed now because we don't have the tools we really need well in place. Uh, but keep in mind, it is also limited. We can quantify risk. If you think of things that cause, that have thresholds, you can think of quantif quantification of risk as one in which we describe, and there are cases where we have enough data to do this now, describe how thresholds might be distributed in a population. How thresholds are distributed in a population. And people at risk would be those who are, have thresholds. We don't know who they are specifically. But in the population, those with thresholds that uh, fall below the, below, above the level of exposure. I'm sorry, below the level of actual exposure would be at risk. Okay? So th their thresholds are, I said that backwards. I have a slide on that. Yes. So we'd look at risk as the percent of the population that experiences exposures greater than the thresholds for individuals in that population. That would be a way to quantify risk and make it probabilistic in the way cancer is. These would generally be, by the way, non-linear models. So uh, risk would not fall off linearly with exposure. But this is a way the world is moving. There are a lot of people working on this. Some, one of the leading investigators is Wei Shui Chu at Texas A&M. Others have worked on this. WHO published something on this recently looking at quantifying, making a quantification of risk for non-threshold, for threshold kinds of toxicities. There's a lot going on in this area. I think it's uh, terrific. Ray has done this for DON, by the way, looking at non-cancer effects of DON and quantifying the risk. I won't say anything more about that, but that's where we need to go. We're not quite there yet. So when we have uh, quantification of risk, I, this is a bit of a repeat, but with category C substances, the adeds, we can establish bright lines, but we quantify the risk at the bright line. So we know what it is as a risk management decision. It isn't just, quote, safe, undefined. Category B substances, we look at different mitigation strategies. We can quantify risks, how risks change with those strategies, and compare them. And so um, I'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, the science and decisions lays out a lot of work that I would say provides some of the backdrop to what Paul described so well with the process form chemicals. Uh, this is a little bit of a repeat that uh, the TDI by itself, uh, uh, I think Kean showed us with his distribution of exposures, you can compare people above or below the TDI. That's okay. But there are better ways to do it because the TDI, we need to know the risk at the TDI and above and below it. That would be a much more informative way to look at the kind of exposure distribution data Kian showed us. So we're moving in that direction, not quite there yet. The, the, the bright line also leads to the temptation, you see this a lot, for the risk assessor to think, gee, I'm setting an ADI 
and a standard, and I know it's not achievable. It's really, really low, because the tax data drive you there. So there's a temptation to kind of adjust it to what you think is achievable. That is an improper role for the risk assessor. It, there is a proper way to do that, but it's a risk management process different from the assessment itself. So this book tries to make those distinctions very, very clear. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but this is the framework for decision making laid out in the book. It's three, three steps. Uh, EPA in particular has written a big volume now trying to put this into practice, and they are routinely trying to follow this framework for important complex uh, decisions about substances they regulate. So I, I'll just summarize and sort of dumb it down a little bit. It has three, these three uh, main steps, beginning with, and this is close to what Paul also described with uh, the process form chemicals, stating what the problem is you're trying to deal with. Now the problem isn't what's the risk of aflatoxin. The problem isn't uh, what should the standard be. The problem is how do we protect public health in the best possible way from aflatoxin exposure. And all the dimensions of the problem then have to be laid out to begin with. And this is a, this is a project undertaken not only by the scientists, but also by risk managers and other stakeholders in the process. What, are we, what problem are we trying to solve? And then laying out from that step, moving to step two is just looking at risk and how risk may then change under different mitigation approaches. But you begin here by laying out the problem, how we deal with it, what are some possible ways we want to mitigate the problem, what kinds of risk assessments do we need to do to understand the effect of those. Then you move to step two, which then goes entirely into the hands of the risk assessor. And you try to get objective as possible a, a picture of the risk uh, under what we call existing conditions, you know, where are we today with respect to exposure and risk, uh, what, st what uh, inter interventions are available, how does risk reduction occur with each intervention. So we need to look at how risk, risk reduction changes, occurs. That exposure needs is a part of that, but we need to go beyond exposure and ask the question, what kind of risk reduction are we getting with each intervention? Are there indirect effects leading to risk increases? Yes, I dare say a lot of actions, for example, with mycotoxins could well lead to increased occupational risk for some people working with the, the uh, materials that, where you're trying to remove the problem. You have to look at indirect effects like that if you want to be complete. You can't ignore them. Um, so that should be considered as well. And then you look at the net effect on human health risk and the comparative benefits of proposed interventions. All this is laid out in that silver book that I described for you. And also the question of uncertainties. I'll come back to that in a second. And then, then once that information is assembled in a proper way and, and analysis is done in a proper way, peer review and all of that kind of stuff, it goes to the risk manager. The questions of risk reduction with various interventions uh, the uncertainties in that, and then also what other factors need to be considered at this point. Practical uh, implementation factors need to be considered. But that's a separate kind of step from the risk assessment itself. Um, and uh, all of this should be done in the ideal world with complete transparency. Uh, there's nothing hidden here with respect to either the science, the uncertainties, and how you went about the analysis. This is a tall order. But it has been done. There are very good examples of this kind of approach to decision making uh, available uh, to look at. Uncertainty here uh, is important. This is always an afterthought in science. You know, in every paper you're required, to, every publication you're required to say at the end the uncertainties. Well, it shouldn't be an afterthought. Uh, and uncertainty is an inherent piece of any risk assessment process. Some people even define risk as uncertainty. You cannot ignore them, you, and, but you've got to deal with them in a way that's useful to, for decision makers, because they should consider it in the decision process. This is much harder than people think it is, but you cannot ignore it. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said, he said that um, it is better to live with uncertainty than to believe things that are wrong. 
I love that quote, because if you haven't considered uncertainty, then what you're believing is wrong. So you're making bad decisions uh, without that. This is very hard stuff. OK, so I think I have to agree with Paul. I think the problem of looking at his decision tree or applying this sort of model to mycotoxins is very hard, seems to me. As an amateur in the mycotoxin control world, it seems inherently very difficult. Uh, lots of possible interventions. We heard those this morning. They differ with the mycotoxin, the food stuff, uh, the country. Uh, and all of those really ought to be considered, I suppose, uh, in any kind of decision model where you're looking at the effects of different interventions. Uh, the, the IARC monograph, uh, Dr. Fu, I think you were part of that monograph, yes, from 2012, yeah, on, uh, there's a lot in there about mitigation, and it sort of spun my head. I kind of tried to understand a lot of that. But this is, a, this is a much more complicated world, it seems to me, than the, the um, um, world of, um, what, what are they? Process chemicals, yes, okay. Anyway, I put down a few thoughts that would flow from um, the decision model laid out by the National Academy and that I tried to sort of summarize very, very simply. So you'd begin uh, with looking at the nature and magnitude of existing public health risks. What's going on now? Where are we today? Uh, you look at even high risk groups. You should not ignore high risk groups. You should try to identify them. So aflatoxin you know, is the prime case where you've got the effect of the uh, hep B virus, which it could be 10 to 30 fold increase of that population is at much, much greater risk for uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinomas, you need to consider them. Look at practical, I call them practicable pre and post harvest interventions that may reduce risk. Conduct research to identify how each intervention and combination of interventions will alter exposure distributions, including those of the high risk group. I notice I use the word exposure distribution because taking point estimates of exposure is not really very informative in a case like this. Study the technical efficacies of each intervention. What are the failure rates? Do we know anything about failure rates of different interventions? We should, if you're going to consider them in a case like this. And then try to look at the total risk reduction achieved with identified intervention strategy. There's more. But I have this little note at the bottom, which is my intuition, that if you're going to look at mitigations that countries use simply to avoid trade problems, I'm, my guess is that they not be effective at all in dealing with the internal problem in the country and may in fact make it worse. So I think you've got to be very, the trade seems to me to complicate this intervention issue uh, in, a, in a serious way. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I thought I'd put it down for discussion. Uh, increasing risk is always possible. Um, I think some very prominent Authority and risk analysis said there's almost no action you can take to reduce risk that doesn't also cause some other increase in risk. And you're blind, you get blinders on if you don't think about that. Costs, costs are important, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I wouldn't, not how they should influence the decision uh, is one matter, but, do, but understanding the costs of different interventions seems important no matter what. And uncertainty should not be an afterthought. They have to be done in a way that risk managers now takes all, take all that information if it's been well developed and think of the answers to these questions at the bottom. That's how it that should work. I will conclude by saying uh, my intuition about this is that the mycotoxin problem is a very difficult problem uh, in food, the food safety world and we don't really understand its full magnitude very well on a global basis. Uh, Point two here is that the contamination can occur at many steps. Different mitigation strategies apply at different steps. Uh, seems to me highly uncertain whether the full risk-based decision model I described here, or even outlined, is practical to implement in every affected country. I'm sure it is not. Moreover, countries that do not have all the required technical skills can't do this. This is not an easy task. The many efforts to identify effective intervention strategies, we heard those described this morning quite well, some of them anyway. A lot of these have been underway for a long time. There's a lot of information in there about intervention. I, 
and different effects of intervention and how well they do and their, maybe even their failure rates, I don't know. But all of that information now ought to be useful and maybe we can, this point number four, some kind of effort to look at all of that in this decision, this risk decision context, which says, let's look at all we've learned about mitigation and now think about it in terms of uh, the risks to health and how they are altered uh, under these different conditions. You have this very systematic framework that might allow you to do this, gathering the right experts, and then you set out risk management options based on that. Options, you don't make the risk management decision, that's a different kind of decision, but at least the options for risk management should be laid out by the technical experts. Uh, to, and with some understanding of how risk is reduced and the uncertainties in that process, the costs, all those kinds of practical implications can be laid out in a way now we hope that's useful for risk management with the proper, proper authorities. So that's a, a possibly feasible project, but I think this is a really, really tough one. Maybe our discussion coming up soon will help uh, uh, you know, think of some ways that we might make this uh, feasible. Thank you very much.